Okay, everybody hear me okay? Great. All right, welcome. Uh, thanks so much uh, for having me here. Uh, I've have been having a, a really, really wonderful time. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Place. Uh, I run the uh, engineering teams and I'm the principal maintainer of the uh, SaltStack project. Uh, hopefully there are uh, some people here who are familiar with uh, SALT and uh, uh, what we do. Uh, I have uh, been at SALT since uh, about uh, 2012. I started there uh, working uh, next to uh, Tom. Some of you know Tom on a very uh, tiny IKEA desk where uh, from time to time whenever he would uh, fix a bug he would shout out and uh, rattle my concentration. And uh, those are the fun times of, uh, of working in uh, a tiny little startup. I want to start out uh, with uh, a little bit of a, a thank you uh, to, uh, to a couple of people, uh, and those are the, the some of the people that we heard from uh, yesterday. Uh, I really, really sincerely admire uh, all the individuals uh, shown here, uh, Luke and Mark and Adam. You know, I started out, uh, you know, using config management way back in the day when I used to work for an independent uh, internet service provider back when those existed in the U.S. Uh, in uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, in the mid '90s, uh, running uh, Linux and uh, and Solera servers, and uh, I remember using CF Engine uh, for the, for the first time uh, and really being struck uh, by the the brilliance and foresight uh, that Mark had. And uh, as I was preparing uh, this presentation uh, this week, uh, I was really, really struck by uh, how many of the ideas that, uh, that Mark thought about and, and worked on uh, all those years ago are still not only relevant, uh, but driving uh, where we're going uh, into the future. Um, those were back in the days when uh, I had, uh, pro I was a Puppet user at the time and I would use Puppet and uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer would come over uh, on the weekends with his kid and let him play under uh, the desk while uh, we uh, uh, configured Puppet. So that was a lot of fun. So thanks to those gentlemen. So uh, what I'm here today to talk about uh, is uh, uh, some ideas uh, around the notion of uh, event-driven infrastructure. This is a term that uh, you may have heard uh, a little bit over, uh, over the past year. And uh, event-driven infrastructure is not, uh, I think, uh, a new idea. Uh, and I think as Adam really, really wisely pointed out uh, yesterday, uh, the best way, one of the best ways to understand, I think, where we're going uh, is to look and understand where we've been. And that is true not only when you look at config and automation, uh, but we're drawing so many of the lessons uh, that we're learning today uh, from the past. And so uh, if you really, really want to understand config in the automation space, uh, I think it's really important to take a little bit of a, a little bit of time to take a short tour uh, back through some of the uh, the history of distributed computing because understanding some of the fundamentals of distributed computing and the problems that people were thinking about 10, 20, 30 years ago uh, really uh, can help us understand what modern infrastructure and what modern automation techniques might look like today. Uh, I want to start with a question that has been on my mind and uh, I can't get it out. Uh, and that is, how do we reason about complexity uh, in infrastructure today? And the reason that I can't get this idea out of my head is because I can't figure out how we describe complexity in a precise way in modern infrastructure. And this is really troubling to me, right? Like if you're a software developer, you know, you go to pretty much any software developer interview, if you go to one of ours, you know, for example, uh, you know, we'll quiz you uh, about big O notation, right? And we'll quiz you about algorithmic complexity and how can you determine uh, in a mathematical or a logical way exactly how complex any given algorithm is, right? You know, hopefully many people in this room are familiar uh, with that notion. Uh, but the thing that I can't get out of my head is uh, try to think about how do we do that for modern infrastructure, right? You walk in in your first day on a job uh, and somebody says, yeah, this is a complex system. And you say, how complex? And they say, 
super complex, like really complex, kind of complex. And this should trouble us a little bit because if we can't describe this even in anything less than general terms, how do we know when we're making progress? Right? How do we know when things are better? It maybe feels a little bit less complex. Uh, we know, I think, in a general sense that infrastructures are getting more and more complex. Uh, and I think the way that we know this in all likelihood is that there's just more of everything, right? There are more containers, more systems, right? We know, you know, we've been through virtualization, we're now into containerization, we're now looking at, you know, really complex uh, application runtime environments. Uh, we know that complexity is increasing, uh, but it's really hard to figure out and reason about how that's happening. Um, and like I mentioned before, new ideas are hard to come by. And so I think when you look at uh, the state of automation today, uh, it's really in many ways uh, a reconstitution of uh, some, some old ideas. When we look at event-driven infrastructure, which we'll start to talk about here in a moment, uh, you know, these ideas were talked about you know, by you know, Larry Ellison, you know, the folks at Oracle. Uh, they've been talked about uh, you know, in terms of you know, ideas like an enterprise service bus, right? We're talking about them now in terms of uh, service meshes. So let's get down to the principles and see if we can sort out what we're really talking about. When I look back at distributed computing, uh, I see three main pillars uh, that we can use to sort of anchor ourselves in the problem, okay? Uh, the first pillar, right, the ability for this distributed system to be aware of A, the existence, and B, the capability uh, of member nodes, okay? B, the ability to coordinate tasks between those nodes, right? And of course, C, uh, and uh, most importantly to our conversation today, um, some type of inter-process communication, right, or inter-node communication, uh, which can connect these nodes in the system to each other. Okay? Um, I want to return to that last point, right, um, and let's call this inter-process or inter-node communication a message bus, okay? It's a way in which nodes or processes on these distributed systems uh, can uh, connect to each other so that they can receive uh, messages from one another uh, and transmit those messages back as well. Super simple, right? So if we dive into that point, let's ask ourselves, okay, fine, what are the properties of a message bus, right, in which these you know, disparate uh, pieces of this system can communicate with each other? One, we need uh, a data model, right, a way in which uh, we have a common uh, structure for the systems to pass messages to each other, right? Secondly, we need something like uh, a command set, right? We need to be able to, across this message bus, uh, you know, have a common command set that does things like, okay, put a message on, right, the wire, take one off, so on and so forth, right? And of course, uh, we need a transport, right? We need a way to, you know, frame these messages up, uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, whether we're going to, you know, pack them into binary or serialize them in some other way. Uh, and then of course, you know, we need uh, a medium and a transport uh, uh, to pass these things around. Now, as we dive into event-driven infrastructure, I want us to take this idea of a message bus, right, this inter-node communication, and move it up into uh, a model for teams, right? And so I'm gonna submit to you that there are message buses for operations folks, right? Um, these are things like uh, monitoring, right, uh, is a message bus. Configuration management, in a way, all right, is a message bus. Things like chat ops, right, auto scaling, right, serverless, right, uh, all message buses for operations, provisioning. Um, but we also have message buses on the uh, developer or the application side, right, of our infrastructure. Anything that connects these various layers of uh, a web stack to each other, right, we can think of uh, as, uh, uh, as having a message bus. And sometimes these are streaming, sometimes they're set up, they're torn down on demand, uh, what have you. 
So given that we have sort of like this operational set of message buses, right, for our teams that we just described, and we have this application that's running uh, in our data centers, the first question that I want us to consider as a part of the notion of event-driven infrastructure is what types of possibilities emerge when these formerly siloed streams of events can be exposed to each other, right? The really classical example that I like to use when we talk about this is uh, what happens when we can, uh, for example, expose streaming information that's coming from our monitoring system to our configuration management system, right? Uh, when we start to think about things in that way, we can come up with ideas uh, that say, oh, okay, there doesn't need necessarily to be this hard wall, right, between this monitoring system that's providing alerts, right, and this configuration management system with us in the middle, right, because, uh, you know, that sucks. Uh, what, what if we could take, you know, the uh, flow of information that was coming in from this monitoring system, right, and have a configuration management system or an automation system that hears those events as they happen and knows how to respond accordingly, right? If that idea is starting to click with you, uh, um, event-driven infrastructure might be something that is of interest. So let's ask ourselves, what does most automation look like right now? Uh, and I say this with uh, all the loving kindness in the world as a person who you know, uh, makes a living by building automation systems. Uh, but in, in a very general sense, automation systems contain you know, packaged workflows, right? Uh, you know, there are a bunch of different approaches about how those workflows should operate. Uh, some vendors, right, you know, SaltStack among them, takes a very data-driven approach to what those workflows should look like. Uh, other vendors take what might be described as a more procedural approach to what those workflows should look like. But they are, at the end of the day, you know, a series of steps, right, you know, a series of uh, actionable, uh, actionable things to do, right, set aside for a moment whether or not those actions are, you know, phrased in, in a, an imperative or a declarative way. It's still, you know, fundamentally a set of actions. Right. Uh, much of the time, of course, uh, as I'm yammering on about, uh, those actions or those workflows are initiated by lazy humans, right? You know, okay, we go and we type out our workflow, right? In the salt world, we type out our salt state or our remote execution command and we figure out our targeting and then, you know, we're off to the races and then we do this again and this is what we do all day and then we go home and have a beer afterwards, right? But Again, with love, right, despite our best efforts, these can be really brittle, right? And one of the reasons that I think this can be really brittle is I think we're still really bad at understanding the real-time state of a system, right, before uh, you know, we take action upon it, right? We make a lot of assumptions. Uh, usually, hopefully, those assumptions are right, uh, but sometimes they're not. And so often uh, when we have outages, right, in our systems, fundamentally, right, if we break this down, uh, what we have is we have a divergence between our assumptions about the state of the system, right, and the actual state of the system, which makes so much of this seem and feel unsustainable. So where can we go, okay? This doesn't feel a whole lot like programming. Right, and whether you think this is awesome, sort of like Adam alluded to the other day, or whether you think this is terrible, really says a lot about you, all right? So, speaking of programming, let's uh, again, you know, return to somewhere outside of automation and talk a little bit uh, about uh, event-driven programming and what that looks like. All right, for those who don't know, who don't come uh, from the, the developer world, uh, event-driven programming is this uh, paradigm, right, uh, where user actions or some type of action, right, um, is, uh, is effectively sensed, right, uh, from other programs or threads, right? Uh, and so what you have is you have uh, a series of listeners, right, which are listening, right, for events that hap are happening, right, in this program. They are listening for a mouse click, right, if, you know, uh, if you've ever uh, written code for iOS, right, like you're listening for, you know, uh, touches, things like that, and then you register handlers, all right, for things that can happen when those events occur, okay? 
So get that paradigm in your head, right? The notion that uh, we can have disparate parts of a system, right? Uh, expand that to the notion of a distributed system, expand that to the notion of an infrastructure. We can have disparate parts of this infrastructure which are listening for events, right, and then responding accordingly, okay? There are a number of examples of event-driven uh, programming, right, in the JavaScript world, and I know, boo, right? Uh, Node.js, right, GUI applications, boo, right? Uh, things of that nature, all right? But there are three principles uh, that I think we can uh, borrow from uh, event-driven programming that I think we can use to think about how we can uh, generalize and move forward uh, with uh, automation. Uh, so the first, uh, sorry, I moved a little too fast. Uh, the first is a set of functions, right, which uh, handle events, right? We talked about that, okay. Um, we know what events we're listening for, uh, and these functions are, you know, in an homage to Mark, uh, effectively promises, right, that when those events happen, that the, you know, function will execute uh, and uh, uh, a thing will run, right? We need a mechanism for binding those functions uh, to those events, right? Uh, and finally, of course, you know, in event-driven programming, uh, we need some sort of loop that's consistently polling for these new events uh, and calling uh, the matching events handlers uh, when uh, an event is received, right? That's all there. At the end of the day, right, that's really what's happening uh, when people are talking about uh, event-driven programming. No, it would be unfair, of course, if uh, you know, we didn't cover some of the criticisms uh, of this sort of thing, because I don't want this to be all you know, flower and roses. Um, you know, on one hand, you know, we have imperative programming, right? People are typically very used to this, right? Like when you're you know, writing shell scripts and you know, whatever it is, you know, most Python looks like that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we have declarative programming, right? We are at config management camp. We should know this debate really, really well, all right? If you don't, come talk to me, and I will give you all my opinions about it. Uh, so additionally, uh, in an event-driven system, right, one of the problems is that uh, this event loop that's running, right, uh, is non-blocking, right? Uh, now that's an important uh, parallel to how you might think about this in a distributed system, right? As events are flowing across, right, uh, there is no real way to block, right? Uh, to, uh, to have one system, to easily block, I should say, to easily have, you know, some sets of systems, right, wait uh, on another, unless that's encoded into, into the logic that you create. Uh, so everything is asynchronous, right? Um, and fundamentally, I think one way to think about uh, event-driven programming, uh, or frankly even event-driven infrastructure, uh, is that uh, it's an imperative and a declarative approach that starts to meld into one, right? And uh, this can take a, a real mind shift, right? It's hard, and it could be challenging to take these formerly uh, procedural uh, workflows, right, and translate them uh, into an event-driven approach. There are some, uh, what I think are some advantages, right? Um, as we have, you know, these, uh, these sets of functions that are bound to uh, a particular event, it makes a really nice, uh, clean dividing line for us to unit test those functions, right? When X event happens, right, Y runs. Super, like, like, that's glorious uh, in a, a testing world. It's highly composable. Um, and, you know, if you come from, you know, the, the uh, DevOps methodology, uh, it, it makes it really easy uh, for uh, both the dev folks and the ops folks to be able to model and think about it. It gives them uh, a common language uh, to speak. Uh, but, you know, um, you know, both you know, procedural and these imperative approaches get brittle, I think, as they, as they grow in length and complexity. Um, and it's a good way to model systems. All right, I'm moving a little slow, so I'll, I'll try to speed up. Anyway, at the end of the day, right, this is uh, the message uh, that uh, I'm trying to get across. If you have a high-speed event bus that can uh, connect your systems together, right, plus, and you take some of the principles uh, of event-driven programming uh, that I've just described, uh, you can uh, begin to uh, approach something that looks like event-driven infrastructure. So, let's talk about this in real terms, now that we're sort of done with a the theory. What are the principles of event-driven automation? Events can originate 
from applications or they can originate from systems. Right? That means an event that flows across a bus that systems uh, can hear and respond to uh, can be anything from uh, my application is spiking in load right, to a disk is nearly full. You know, to new code has been provisioned, right? To a build failed on my CI/CD system, right? Um, and these can all all flow across a bus, and these disparate systems uh, can hear uh, these events uh, as they happen. Okay. Uh, the second principle uh, of event-driven automation that I would point to uh, is that uh, mechanisms should exist uh, to sort, to collate these events, uh, and to apply uh, rules to them, right? Um, you know, machines or nodes need to know, oh, okay, I've heard event uh, X, right? Uh, I have a rule that says if I hear event X, right, I do things, you know, Y and Z, or I heard event X, and I only do Y if I've heard three other Ys in the past 60 seconds, right? Things of that nature. So that would be a rule set, right? And uh, as these rules are matched, uh, the registered actions occur, right? This sounds like a lot of theory, but at the end of the day, there's re this really isn't that complicated, right? One of the like, amazing things, as I mentioned uh, in the first part of my presentation, uh, is that this is really just promise theory again, right? Like this is just a new way to apply uh, Mark's idea. And I shouldn't even say new way, that's unfair. This is just a different way uh, to apply uh, one of Mark's central ideas. There are of course disadvantages and I you know, like to, uh, to try to be fair. Uh, it is possible in an event-driven approach to have tight coupling between this event schema, right? This set of possible events that can uh, flow through your system. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and consumers uh, of the schema. Uh, message loss, of course, is, uh, is problematic. Um, you know, if, for example, you have a workflow that says, oh, okay, uh, when uh, code is deployed you know, across my CI CD system, first take down the load balancers, and then when the load balancers come back up, they should send a message, right, that brings the application back online. Well, if you lose that message, you know, in step two, right, that the load balancers have uh, not come up, uh, you know, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, message loss, you know, <laughs> either in computing systems or in human systems is, is problematic and, you know, exists in many places, but it's something to think about here. Uh, like I alluded to before, reasoning about what might be blocking operations in a procedural sense, right, uh, can uh, potentially become a little bit more difficult. Uh, and testing, uh, especially uh, as you begin to uh, build out um, longer and longer chains of events to uh, register and listen to and respond to, uh, means some changes in the approach uh, that you're going to have to take to figure out how to test all of this stuff. Some of the advantages of this that, that I see, um, I see this uh, as a path toward uh, scalability. It's going to become harder and harder and harder and harder uh, for us to scale these systems, um, whether or not uh, it's an immutable approach, whether or not uh, it's a top-down hierarchical approach to managing these systems. One of the only paths forwards that I can see is uh, being able to provision these systems and have those systems from the point that they're provisioned uh, as much as possible uh, act autonomously uh, to listen to events that they should be interested in uh, and respond to those events and to, uh, if they don't know the answer, if they don't have a complete picture, uh, to ask for more information. Uh, in my view, uh, that's, that's the way we're gonna need to go. Um, I mentioned this is like a DevOps uh, automation backplane. Um, you know, that's fine. <laughs> uh, this does more than just configure and provision systems uh, at, at their birth. I think uh, one of the things that I think is most important uh, to think about in this space is lifecycle management. If you've ever heard me rant and rave about this stuff, uh, I feel very strongly uh, that, uh, that automation needs to think about the entire lifecycle uh, of the machine. Uh, too often, in my view, 
uh, this space is framed as this idea of, oh, okay, this is going to be primarily about the birth of the system, right? This is going to be about, uh, I have a stock you know, Red Hat image here, and I need to apply you know, some set of states to it, and I need to make it into entity X. Right, and you know, from that point, the automation system uh, doesn't play as much of a role. Uh, I think the automation system can and should play as much of a role throughout the lifetime of the system uh, as it does uh, at its birth. Uh, and the final advantage uh, is that I believe it provides an immediate and common programmable language uh, that exists on top of some of these systems. So fine, uh, how do we build one of these, All right? Uh, I'm going to talk, you know, in a general sense, this will roughly kind of model the way uh, SaltStack has built theirs, uh, but uh, hopefully it should be generic enough that uh, if you want to take some of these ideas and, you know, build out proof of concepts for your own systems, uh, it should give you a start. Okay, uh, the first thing we need to do uh, is we need to think about uh, the flow of messages across these bus. An event is emitted, right? It would flow uh, to a manager, right? Which could be uh, either a centralized manager or it could be a manager which exists on a system to be managed. The manager checks to see if the event matches uh, a registered handler. If so, the series of rules are checked. Um, and when rules are matched, right, an action is undertaken. That's really all that's happening here. So what moving pieces do we need? We need an event bunch transport, right? Uh, we need uh, telemetry, right? We need uh, events, right, uh, to, uh, to flow across the system so that we can, you know, imbue this thing with some meaning. Uh, we need actors, right, which uh, can, you know, receive these events and act upon them if appropriate. Uh, and uh, we need uh, reactors, right, which can uh, take these events, right, as they come in, right, uh, figure out if uh, reaction is needed and uh, potentially translate those uh, events and, uh, and rebroadcast them. Uh, okay, so what sorts of things do we need uh, to build uh, just any sort of, I think, generic message bus? Uh, it should handle security, it should handle reliability, it should handle serialization. Uh, it may handle, you know, any, any of these things, right? Uh, we don't need to get uh, too much into this. I'll put these slides up, of course, so that you can refer to them later uh, if you so desire. Uh, the most common message bus topology, right, uh, that, that, that I see, right, would be something like, uh, like PubSub. Uh, this, I don't think, is a requirement for this type of model, uh, but... Um, you know, most of those implementations are, are brokered, right? I'm, you know, again, I come from, you know, the salt stack world, right? Uh, zero MQ is, uh, is our mama. Um, you can use push pull, right? There's simply no reason uh, that you couldn't or you could use fan out, whatever, whatever floats your boat. No, of course, there are all kinds uh, of projects, right, that will give you most of what you need right off the shelf, right? Uh, and most people in this room, I think, are familiar with what those are, right? Like I said, uh, zero MQ is our weapon of choice, right? There are all types of other message queues, right? Um, salt stack, of course, I would point out uh, being one of those, right? So uh, we talked about telemetry, the ability for applications to emit uh, events onto this bus, right? Uh, this telemetry should be light and easy enough that it's simple enough to point, uh, port into, into language. Uh, why? Because uh, if we have this application right, that's running in the uh, distributed sense, uh, we want to make it easy for our developers, uh, when appropriate, to be able to uh, emit their own events onto this bus. Right? Uh, because in that way, uh, I think we have a really nice uh, mechanism uh, for developers to say, oh, okay, here's some application telemetry that I'm thinking about, right? Uh, you know, the application is, you know, under stress or under load or some event has happened. We can put that onto the bus, right? And if our automation and configuration management system, all of our automation systems are underneath uh, listening to those, uh, then we can have the infrastructure <coughs> configure itself uh, or reconfigure itself uh, as appropriate. This telemetry, of course, should be lightweight messaging. Don't push a bunch of uh, information around. So for those of you uh, who are uh, Python programmers, which like these days in 2018 is probably a lot of us, uh, here is you know, very much how simple it is uh, to 
build one of these uh, in Python. This is zero MQ, right? Uh, and this is it. I don't know how many lines of code this is, you know, like probably 10 or 15. Uh, but something like this, right? Uh, you're up and running, you know, with, uh, with a message bus uh, and sending messages uh, to uh, connected clients. So super easy. Again, the slide will be up. Uh, so decision engines, right? A decision engine um, in a system like this uh, would be would be what uh, takes these events, right? That uh, are registered, right? And figures out which actions uh, need to be performed. Of course, you know these can be as simple or as complex as uh, a person wants, right? Um, I didn't build out uh, the code for what a decision engine uh, would look like, at least not in this presentation. I have some up on GitHub that you can look at if you're so inclined. Uh, but it's really you know, not that hard, right? So what I displayed here would be uh, what this might look like uh, in a configuration sense, right? Uh, you know, we have on the top there uh, client load, right? Uh, which this sort of models the way that uh, Salt does this in, in some way. Um, that uh, would say something like, oh, okay, if I receive any event in the client load uh, namespace, uh, here are uh, a set of reactions, right? Um, so I have three areas here, right? I have uh, a reaction, right, uh, which says, oh, okay, uh, you know, print this thing, right, uh, log this thing. Uh, I have a register, right, uh, which can uh, control the number, or I'm sorry, forgive me, uh, record the number of events that have happened over a particular time or the type, right, uh, so that we can do things like say, oh, okay, if we've received X number of events or X number of events of severity, right, uh, a register can uh, put together and control these, right. Uh, and then uh, a set of rules, right? And that's where you know we tie together, right? Something like uh, a register, right? And a set of reactions. So this is by no means like some sort of like magical best practice. This is you know stuff you might think about if you know uh, building something like this is is your piece of pie. Uh, so an actor is simply what's run, right? As the result uh, of an event uh, matching a given rule. Uh, this would be things like call an external service, right? So, oh, okay, uh, my, you know, uh, I heard from my uh, CICD system, right, that code was deployed, and so I, this is like a silly example, uh, I heard from the CICD system that code is deployed, uh, therefore I want to uh, call out to my chat ops, uh, my chat ops, you know, service, and, you know, let the dev team know, uh, plus, uh, I know that every time the code is deployed, I need to start restart services X, Y, and Z, right, on machines, you know, A, B, and C, so on and so forth, right? Could be a configuration management call, like I just said, code running locally, what have you, okay. So it should be no secret by now uh, that, uh, that SaltStack, you know, sees the world uh, in this way. Um, one interesting thing, and I really have no idea uh, if, uh, if Tom is going to be upset about me telling this story or not, so let's all tweet it out and find out. Um, which is that uh, when we started uh, building Salt uh, in 2011, uh, we did not set out to build a configuration management system, right? Uh, the problem that we were trying to solve at the time, or Tom was trying to solve, was, was remote execution. Uh, and config management, uh, people kept you know, coming and saying, oh, you know, this needs to do config. And Tom was like, mm, I, mm, I don't really want to. Uh, and finally, it just really got to the point uh, where resistance was futile and you know, pull requests were coming in to start to add a config layer. And uh, we ended up doing that. And you know, as, as things go with these sorts of projects, uh, you, know, you go where the, where the community wants to go in many instances. But um, I think that has informed the way we see configuration management now, uh, which is you know, fundamentally as, um, as a service uh, which exists inside a generalized automation framework. Right? Uh, we don't see you know, config as this you know, application that you deploy. We see config as what does the heavy lifting right, inside of a much larger automation space. 
So how do we think about this? How, how have we structured this? Uh, here's you know, our, our sort of marketing uh, diagram. Uh, but uh, you know, we have a, a many to one model right, uh, for what we call uh, masters and minions. Right? Masters are the centralized management nodes uh, which are, can connect uh, to what we call minions, which are the managed nodes. Right? Uh, and they connect across, as you can see, uh, an event bus, right? Which for us, like I said, uh, is zero MQ. Events are flowing across this bus. Uh, they can say things like, okay, uh, apply this configuration. Uh, but the really nice thing about this event bus, uh, in my view, is that uh, it's persistent, right? Uh, this is not something that uh, uh, Gets that where you connect right and you do your work and then you tear down uh, the connection like you would have you know in, a, in an SSH based world. This is a persistent uh, TCP connection so that we always have events uh, flowing uh, across this bus. Now uh, on the uh, the master side of things, uh, we have what are called engines, uh, which are uh, simply. Uh, uh, Python programs, right, uh, that can uh, run in a process and connect to this bus. Uh, and that uh, allows a really simple way uh, for you to go, oh, okay, on the master side, I'm gonna listen for events that come in uh, from the minions. And that way I know, right, if I'm interested in a particular event, I can write some, re I can write five lines of Python that say, oh, okay, event X has happened, right, perform action uh, Y. Um, also on the master, we have uh, what we call the idea of a reactor, which is how we tie together uh, the configuration management service, right, uh, to events uh, that are happening, right? And so an event will flow in uh, from the infrastructure on the master, the reactor can be configured to listen for this event and, you know, when it occurs, uh, you know, some action uh, is deployed out onto the system. So that allows uh, you know, these complex distributed systems uh, to have a central point where events can flow into uh, and then the system can be dynamically and automatically uh, reconfigured as events of interest uh, are registered. Now I won't go too much into this, uh, but uh, you know, we also have uh, a, a small notion called the beacon, right, which is uh, basically the, uh, the, telemetry emit, uh, the telemetry emitting system, right, uh, that allows uh, these individual minions to, you know, once a second or once every 10 seconds, say, uh, just exist or emit an event, right, that says, uh, oh, okay, uh, now I, let's say, I say, now I am at load X, right, or file Y has been recently updated or, you know, so on and so forth. It's all just really nice, easy, lightweight Python. You can pick up how to write any one of these in, you know, a couple of minutes. Uh, so it's super easy. Um, yeah, I actually just like blew through all this stuff. Really simple. Uh, so let me talk about uh, like a real world practical example. So hopefully, you know, all this uh, theory can connect to a real space in your head, uh, which is, uh, you know, how to translate uh, events uh, with an engine. Okay, so uh, let's exam or let's imagine, you know, we're configuring a network, right? Uh, and so what happens is, okay, here on uh, our networking device, right, uh, we go, oh, okay, a thing has happened. Uh, therefore, um, uh, the networking device, right, this in case, in this case, running salt, right, or what it, specifically what would be a salt proxy, but the operational detail, uh, would emit uh, this event onto the bus. As you can see, this is just structured data, right? This is, you know, just a dictionary, right? And it says, okay, this thing has happened, and here's some information about the thing, all right? Uh, over on the uh, the master side, right? Or we actually can run uh, reactors. Well, yeah, you know, pretty much anywhere these days. Um, we have a reactor that basically says, oh, "Okay, hey, you know what? If I hear any event, right, that uh, uh, matches this namespace, uh, here are." two state changes, right? Here are two uh, sections of configuration management state uh, that I want to change, right? Go and do the, these things, right? Uh, as you can see, oh, pardon me, right? This refers to uh, two states, right? Um, IF down, right? And IF down send mail, right? Uh, I should point out, I'm pretty sure I borrowed this example from Mircha, so if he's here, Mircha, sorry for not asking permission and thank you. Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, here is the, the state file, uh, which simply describes uh, the thing that we're going to do. Now we're deep into what should be regular configuration management, right? Um, you know, this is, if you know salt, right, this should be uh, extremely obvious. I don't need to get into how to write salt state files uh, for this. Uh, anyhow, uh, my slides are there. I did borrow this from Mircha. Uh, you can read more about that example there. Uh, so, in review, all right, uh, some of the takeaways uh, that uh, I hope uh, can come across. Uh, the first is to build scalable systems, right? We need to, you know, adopt the historical lessons uh, of distributed computing, right? And we can migrate from, you know, simple human-initiated workflows, right, uh, to something that is more reactive, that is more event-driven. Uh, and we can use that uh, to manage some of the complexity uh, in our system. And uh, finally, event buses are pretty good, so let's build more of those. Um, and, uh, you know, the last thing to say is, uh, you know, hopefully you can build on top of uh, tools like SALT uh, that can give you a full automation toolkit up and down the stack. And, uh, you know, even if it's not SALT, uh, the final thing that I would like to say is that, uh, you know, if you look at SALT, uh, please don't use SALT until you've looked at Puppet and Chef, right, and CF Engine, uh, because these are really, really wonderful tools that I admire uh, very much, and I absolutely encourage everybody to look at all the ideas uh, that are in this space, uh, because there, there are so many smart people bringing uh, so much to the table. Uh, and like I, I said in the very beginning, I'm very, very grateful uh, to them for, uh, for all their work and, and all the inspiration. So that's it. I don't know if I have time for questions or not. I really did not get a timer out. So uh, three minutes, no questions. Yeah, OK. Oh, I can have questions. OK. Uh, so uh, are there questions? <laughs> Yeah, uh, it does help me understand the, com yeah. oh, can I repeat the question? Does all of this help me understand the complexity of a system, and if so, how? Uh, yes, I think, well, there are two things to say. One, I think there's a much larger conversation to be had about uh, how we are modeling systems these days, all right? Uh, because, um, <laughs> look, even if, uh, we're describing systems, right, as we're doing right now in, in some systems like SALT, basically from a data-driven approach, right, which basically says, okay, this is system X, this is system Y, so on and so forth. I really don't think that's where modeling needs to be. I think we can do much, much better, right? Uh, and um, in this case, this does help me look at an individual system and reason uh, about its role, right? And reason in what I consider to be a really clear way about the promises, right, that uh, it is supposed to be keeping uh, and uh, the, what it's supposed to be responding to. Um, one of the lessons that I've learned as I've gone through this, you know, for many, many years is that not every system and not every approach clicks with every brain, right? Some people look at, at SALT and they're like, this is the way my brain works. And some people look at it and they're like, this is not, <laughs> right? Uh, for me, yeah, this does make sense. And it makes sense because um, I, I'm a big fan of the promise theory approach. And to me, this uh, outlines that in a, a way that's very clear to my brain. So, yeah, other questions? Yeah. When more and more types of messages move to the network, mm. do you think there's a need to separate that network or to work with priorities? Sure. I do think there, there is absolutely uh, a need to separate that network, and topology here is not something that I got into because it's just too much of, of a topic. Uh, but yes, is the, is the short answer to that question. Uh, I think there's a lot more work uh, to do in this in this space. I think uh, we need to be able to uh, introduce uh, authorization, right, and uh, uh, better uh, security um, instead of having a, a simply a, a truly flat space uh, for all of this. Uh, but yes, that's 
that is a concern and is going to be more of a concern moving forward. The question was uh, whether or not uh, we will need to uh, separate out uh, these message buses for you know various reasons, right? Be it I, I, I presume um, you know either sort of like politically based because of different teams or different types of infrastructure or simply because of scale. And the, the short answer is yes. I think that will need to happen, uh, but I also think that we can design systems that can make it happen. So, let's do one more. So. You didn't come back to the point of complexity. <laughs> I didn't, and it's because I don't know the answer to it, right? Like, I, this is one of those things where um, I, I don't know, right? Like, this is a question that I think we should think, we should think about this week, right? Um, I wish I did, right? Uh, but I don't, and I can only, I can only be fair about it. But um, I do think it's a wonderful question to think about, though, right? Um, uh, I would like for us to have that conversation, right, about why it seems to be so problematic that, um, that we can't find what I see as particularly precise terms for describing uh, that information, uh, that growing complexity, right? Uh, and so, uh, you're absolutely right that that was, that was kind of like a late edition. I was up like late last night and like, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna talk about this. I know it's not super related, uh, but it's stuck in my brain and that's kind of how it got into this presentation. So yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but I would love to start a larger conversation about it because I think it's, I think it's an important problem to think about. So, okay, that, those are my three questions. Uh, I'll be around, so thanks everyone for, for your time.